Hey folks, George here. Uh, today we're going to talk about a Japanese short story by a young female writer named Fujino Kaori. Her story today is called Run. The peculiar thing about Fujino is that she's not terribly well known in the English-speaking world. Not many of her works have been translated into English. Uh, that said, she is much better known in Japan, where she has won the very prestigious Akutagawa Prize, uh, one of the top and premier uh, literary awards given to Japanese writers in Japan. Um, one thing that I also like about this book is that it is a nice piece of genre fiction, right? Uh, I found the short story in this book here, Hansai Japan. Uh, it's a nice anthology of uh, crime and borderline horror stories that we that I can see here in Japan. Uh, let me read the uh, subtitle really quick of the book. The Fantastical Futuristic Stories of Crime from and about Japan. Uh, one thing about some of the stories here, about half the stories are from Japanese writers translated into English, and the other half of the stories are English stories written by uh, American and Western writers uh, writing about Japan. One thing that I like about genre fiction, and now I'm already jumping a little bit ahead. Uh, before I jump ahead, let me just remind us what we will try to address today. Of course, I'm going to talk about plot, characters, setting, and themes. I also want to talk about the structural and formal details of the work, uh, the intertextual connections that we could talk about, and the historical uh, context of this work, along with my own personal uh, attachments to the work. Uh, let's start with my own personal attachments really quick, right? One, my personal attachment is I, I'm a sucker for crime and horror fiction, and by the way, crime and horror movies too. I love these genre pieces. Uh, what do I like about them? Well, number one, they're kind of exciting, right? Uh, th just the nature of crime, the nature of horror is uh, visceral and stimulating to somebody like me. Yeah, uh, that said, that said, when we do look at, now I want to jump ahead and talk about formal and structural uh, details of the work. Uh, I just described it as a genre piece, uh, a genre fiction piece. Uh, what does that mean? That means, well, yeah, it kind of fits within that horror or crime genre, right? Uh, some people look at that as a bit um, with less prestige let's say, than high literary works that are supposed to talk about love and death and life and growth and things like that. Whereas a lot of adventure books, uh, crime books, uh, murder mysteries, uh, romance novels even, right, are looked down upon by many people. Um, and I'll confess myself that I do... Uh, sometimes take a very highbrow approach to so many of these literary issues and go, oh, I don't read that lowbrow stuff. You'll forgive me. I, I do sometimes suffer from a, a bit of hypocrisy in this regard. Um, that said, that's why I want to try to address a nice piece of horror slash crime fiction and see how we could address that. Um, why do I like that sort of crime horror genre literature? Because I think when it's done very well, oh, and by the way, science fiction would, of course, be, would fit nicely into this sort of genre literature, right? But when it's done very well, yes, I believe that a lot of these genre pieces, whether it's film or literature or otherwise, can make us look at pieces of our society, of the community around us, in, with a different lens. Right. This particular short story is about a serial killer. Yeah. Uh, somebody whom I would call a serial killer is funny because I call the person a serial killer. The writer, the narrator, never calls himself a serial killer. He does use other disparaging words to describe himself. He calls himself a psycho. What does that say? That I think that we look at serial killers. I think we and I myself look at psychos in society with a very different lens, right? Uh, I, I'm very judgmental, I'll, I'll be honest about myself. And I look at serial killers and I think that serial killers are terrible. <laughs> Forgive me. Uh, Ted Bundy, uh, who are some of the other fun ones? The Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez, when I was a kid. 
uh, Richard Ramirez was kicking around Los Angeles. Uh, who's the one that eats, that ate a lot of people? Uh, Jeffrey Dahmer. You'll forgive me. I don't like serial killers. However, what nice genre writers can do for us and did for me in this particular story is make me look at my own judgments with a more critical eye. Make me look at myself with a criti more critical eye and reevaluate my preconceived notions, make me reevaluate the judgments that I'm so quick to proclaim upon others. And that's what I like about genre fiction, is it pulls me in because I just have sort of a visceral attraction to crime and murder mysteries. And that kind, and horror as well. Those sorts of uh, genre pieces that are sometimes discarded as being lower class or lower uh, brow works of art. Except when they're done well, they make people like me reevaluate how I look at society and even literature and lowbrow art in general. Maybe I shouldn't dismiss such genre pieces quite so quickly as I do. And so I'm going to give a chance to this uh, genre piece run about, like I said, a, a murder not a murder mystery, just a, about a murder. We follow a murderer around. And see if we could glean any interesting features about Japan in the post-311 world. This story was written in 2015, right? So let's talk about, uh, really quick, Japan in the post-311 era, right? Well, post-311, 311 referring to the triple disaster of the earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear meltdown that happened in, on March 11th, 2011, and how that really made people reevaluate and works as a watershed moment in Japanese history. I think I've remarked earlier that sometimes these earthquakes, these natural disasters, work as significant watershed moments in Japanese history where Japanese society can look at itself and say, oh, there was before 311? And there was Japan after 311, and society changed in certain ways. Well, we could see if that, but well, we need a few more years, I imagine, to really see how uh, the effects and how society might change. But I do think that such events help creative writers like Fujino herself look at society a bit differently and try to look with a more critical eye. Because one thing that did happen as a result of this post-311 world is that we question all of the preconceived notions that were just given to us by uh, those in power. I might say the system. Some people would say the government. But what is the dominant discourse in Japan and in other places? And how does that dominant discourse influence us? And how might we, as readers, how might Fujino as a writer, try to look at the dominant discourse with a bit of more of a critical eye in order to say, wait a second, maybe we should reevaluate things just a little bit. And how uh, better to help us, the reader, reevaluate things and look at society with a different eye from a different perspective than to have us follow around the protagonist. Now let's talk about the characters. Have us follow around the protagonist who is a self-proclaimed psycho. He calls himself two things. Uh, the first word of the story is psycho, and then at the end of that first line is the word bashes. So he says, psychos can really leg it. You know, the ones who become bashers. And what he's saying right there about himself is, number one, he is a psycho. He reveals himself to be a psycho later in the story. But even more than being, being a psycho, he's a basher, a killer. And later on in the story, he does describe himself as, how do I bash people? Well, I get a jar of honey, and I put it in a sack, and I beat people over the head with it. And that's how I kill them. That's how I attack people. And that's going to be a wildly different protagonist than I'm accustomed to. Right? Following around and rooting 
maybe not rooting, but trying to understand at least. Trying to understand the perspective of a serial killer. And that's where Fujino really challenges the reader and shows her craft. Because by the end of the story, indeed, I am sympathetic with the protagonist. He does describe his girlfriend as the other character in this short story as being somebody who has fashion as her hobby. Why do we have to talk about her buying clothes and things like that? Well, here's another thing that he says about her. She earns more money than me. Why say that? When you say something, aren't you trying to say that this is important, that I see it as important? I see, I say it because I think it's worth saying as a psycho, as a person. I'm interpreting that as a sort of discomfort, a discomfort with a woman making more than the man. Some people might say, well, he doesn't say he's uncomfortable about it. What I am asking, though, is that since he has to say it as a narrator. It is important to him. And things that are you're comfortable with, things that you're comfortable with, you don't usually say. So that's why I question his comfort with his girlfriend making more money than he does. He also says about himself that why does he bash? Well, because there's a voice in his head. There's a voice in his head that says, run. There's a voice chasing him throughout the story that says, run. And isn't that a bit of a neurotic behavior? Number one, to hear voices in your head in the first place. But number two, that the voice in your head is imploring you to do such antisocial behavior. Right? Namely, bash people over the head with a jar of honey. How else does he talk about his girlfriend now? She, he does say that fashion is her hobby. But what else does he say? He says her infatuations change so quickly. What does that entail? Well, that she goes from one thing to another to another to another. We'll talk about why I think that's important. But then he says about his girlfriend, she's a perfect fit for me. Again, I'm asking, why do you have to say this? Why do you have to say she's a perfect fit for me? Because after all, for people who feel comfortable in certain situations, you don't always have to say something. The fact that you do have to say it entails some sort of, in my interpretation, some sort of irony that's being brought to the picture. The fact that I have to say she's a perfect fit for me makes me wonder if he doubts, the narrator doubts, because this is a first-person narrator, after all. If he actually doubts that she is a perfect fit for him. Well, let's talk about the plot now, then, because the plot will see if she is or isn't a perfect fit for him, right? Uh, it's a fairly simple story. Uh, he's a self-assessed uh, psycho. He runs around killing people because of voices in his head, of course, until finally one victim fights back and kills him. And who is this victim that fights back and kills him? His girlfriend. His girlfriend is the one who fights back and kills him at the end of this short story. Why is that interesting? Well, that kind of challenges this notion that she's a perfect fit for him. Or we could do this sort of ironic interpretation. She's such a perfect fit for him, for a serial killer, that she killed him. There's quite a bit of irony there, isn't there? That's an interesting feature of this story. Why is the setting interesting here? And I do think that once we understand uh, the setting a little bit more, it will help us feed into the themes. Number one is that the setting, it makes me think, as he describes his girlfriend, much richer than he is, and buying so many things, like clothes and fashion goods, that are expensive. I'm thinking, oh, this must be in a rich part of town. However, he's very clear, despite her high salary, her apartment is 25 minutes from this train station. By using the word despite there, we're seeing that the narrator does make that connection and suggests, wait a second, she does have this high salary. She should live closer to the train station. But clearly, she lives in a less fine part of town. Despite that my assumption coming into this would be, oh, she must be in an affluent part of town, right? 
She has a very expensive hobby, fashion. Despite those wealthy behaviors, she actually lives in not so nice a part of town. Now, she says, she tries to justify this and says, well, yeah, but because I work in the city, I want to be someplace quiet or away from the city. And that's why this is the way it is. However, the first person narrator contradicts that notion of hers and goes against that notion of hers because he does say at night, it's the worst place you can be because he's going to meet her. And by the way, have a, have a bit of a killing himself. Why is that interesting here? Well, number one, we've got this different notion here. Number one, she's a very affluent, presumably, individual who works a high salary job in the city, has an expensive hobby, fashion. Yet by living in a place that the narrator suggests is not the best place to be at night, it's making me question what affluence really means. And that's one way that I think Fujino is challenging the reader and challenging our preconceived notions of society in general and specifically Japan in this post 311 era, era and saying, is Japan really as affluent as it pretends to be? Is Japan really affluent? If you have a high uh, earning job, you have a high uh, and expensive hobby, but you have to live in a bad part of town. Now you'll forgive me, I live in New York City, right? And I know all of these sorts of crazy contradictions or seemingly paradoxical notions of life where many people uh, have very high earning jobs. I remember when I first moved here, I met somebody who worked in Wall Street. Like, wow, you work in fine. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what his job was in Wall Street, but uh, yeah, in Wall Street, and uh, very expensive job. He was living in an apartment with seven other people. I was like, wow, you make so much money, and you're living in an apartment with seven other people. That's is that really affluence? It helps me question what wealth and what affluence really means. Certainly, Fujino is asking that about uh, post-311 Japan, I believe. Is Japan really as affluent as it really seems to be? I've already discussed in my previous uh, discussion the nature of the economic bubble bursting, the stagnant Japanese economy. So the question will be, wait, yes, even today Japan is the third richest country in the world, but what does that mean if you're living, for example, this is the question that pops in my head, if you're living in a place where you don't really think is safe at nighttime, what is the meaning of affluence if you're not safe? What is the meaning of affluence if you're living in a small apartment that's barely bigger than what you see here? That helps me question the very fundamental preconceived notions of our society. And I think that's what Fujino is doing right here, asking the reader to question how we see ourselves in society. Now, with all that said, what are the themes that Fujino is discussing or asking us to explore in this work? Well, the first and most obvious one is with the first word of the story, psycho. So what I'm thinking of is mental disorders. And how do we look at mental disorders in society? How does Fujino look at and see mental disorders in Japan? in this post-311 era. Number one, the first person narrator does suggest that, you know what, yes, I'm a psycho. And the reason I'm a psycho is because I've got voices in my head telling me to run. However, people are chasing me too, namely the police, right? And here's where Fujino throws us a curveball and the first person narrator throws us a curveball and says, wait a second, maybe they, the police who are chasing me, who want to stop me. Maybe they're being chased by their own assailants. Maybe they're psychos just as much as I am. And by the way, who's chasing them? Other psychos. Isn't this just a dog-eat-dog -dog sort of world? And isn't our notion of mental disorder a dog-eat-dog -dog sort of world? Everyone's being chased by some psycho. And by the way, everyone is a psycho. 
in one way or another. And that's the challenge that we're all posed with upon reading Fujino's short story here. How might I be a psycho? How might I be suffering from a mental disorder? I said earlier how easy it is for me to judge serial killers. I look at Ted Bundy and I say, oh, that person is evil. Clearly Ted Bundy is evil. Clearly he deserves to be put away. And I want to judge Ted Bundy very quickly. But what I think Fujino is asking is, wait a second, George. Might you be as psychotic as Ted Bundy is? Now, of course, my first impulse, no, no way, Jose. I'm not killing people. I'm not a serial killer. However, what it seems that Fujino is taking us this extra step with, especially on uh, page 203, he's watching TV with his girlfriend, and he sees a story about himself. The girlfriend says, not again. That's near here. This is scary, he responds. You've got to be careful, I whisper. Yeah, I will. I always am, she says. She's so cute, I end up teasing a little. The people who do this stuff, I'll bet they're desperate too, running from their own unseen demons. What kind of unseen demons, she asks, her voice tense. She's still facing the TV, the light ridges that run along the top of her ear are on display. I don't say psychos like me. Oh, I don't know, society, I say instead. People making unreasonable demands, work, an inability to believe in the future of our political system, she doesn't turn around. Why do I focus on that section on page 203? Because it seems to me that there is the crux of what Fujino is throwing at us, the reader, and challenging us with. Perhaps serial killers and other, let's, let's, let's soften up from serial killers for a second. Let's just talk about psychos or even soften up from that a little bit. Really, mental disorders. Mental disorders. What are these mental disorders that people are suffering from? And the serial killer in this story himself suggests, I don't know, society? Might society be driving people crazy? What about people making unreasonable demands? Work? An inability to believe in the future? Our political system? Aren't those things, things we can relate to that drive us a little mad? That might push us to the brink? Now there's an old uh, uh, Christian phrase that I like, old Christian idiom that says, ah, there but for the grace of God go I. And yes, I, George, I'm lucky that I don't go crazy. But believe me, society does tend to drive me a little mad. Believe me, uh, unreasonable demands tend to drive me a little bit mad. Work drives me a little bit mad. And I feel fortunate that I am able to balance this right now. But the first person narrator in the story, the protagonist of this story, can't. And how many other people out there do struggle with those unreasonable demands in society? Oh, and let's not forget the political system he mentions also. Doesn't the political system drive us mad? Well, I don't know. I guess you have a different, if you don't think that's the case, I suppose you have a different set of friends on Facebook and social media who, uh, yeah, I'm looking at my friends on social media and they're all quite incensed about the political situation. And doesn't this drive people mad? Doesn't this make some people crazy? And there but for the grace of God go I. Because I imagine that if it were just a little harder for me, I might snap too. I might snap too. And Fujino, I think, is trying to remind us of that feature of mental disorders. One thing that reminds me of is an old French philosopher uh, who was really big in the 60s and 70s, named Michel Foucault. He famously wrote a book called uh, Madness and Civilization, where he challenges the very 
understanding of mental disorder. What does he say about mental disorder? He ultimately suggests, Michel Foucault does, that we as a society merely try to isolate the undesirables. We call them psychos. And by calling certain people psychos or mentally disabled or mentally incompetent, we don't have to deal with them anymore, do we? We get to shun them, put them aside, and in the most extreme cases, lock them up and forget about them. But who gets to say who's psycho? Well, we do. Those of us who are reasonable. Now, I don't want to push uh, as far as some people would and suggest that there's no such thing as reasonableness. And I also don't want to push so far as to suggest that there isn't a such thing as a genuine mental disorder. But those of us who've been in education for a little bit, especially those of us who work with children, might be aware that so many people in certain schools, I work in New York City, so many people in New York City schools are diagnosed with mental disorders or learning disabled. And what does that do? That effectively isolates them or segregates them from the rest of society, from the rest of the general education population. Why? Because they are labeled with a mental disorder. And thus we get to treat them differently. And for the, some of us who are uh, a little bit more politically minded, might we be aware of the fact that in places like New York City, it is mostly divided amongst racial lines. What do I mean by that? What I mean is many students in New York City schools, for example, and I think schools around America too, who are labeled with mental disorders or learning disabilities are predominantly not white. What might that say? And how might we consider that when we are talking about mental disorders? Now, that's just one political aspect of this. Right? That's just one aspect of this. Now, how do we deal with such people? Fujino doesn't exactly give us an answer to that question. Because by the end of the story, the serial killer is killed. But if we refer back to one of my favorite uh, idiomatic expressions, there but for the grace of God go I, uh, I don't want to be killed. And I'm not sure that I want to wait for all the people with mental disorders to simply be killed. The question remains then, the question emerges, well, how shall we work with such people? Fujino doesn't give us an answer, unfortunately. But it does have value, I think, just in the fact that she does raise the question, how shall we treat people with mental disorders? Shall we just call them psychos and thus segregate them and thus imprison them? Or shall we try to treat them with a little bit more uh, sympathy, understanding, and patience. Perhaps. Perhaps. And would it shock any of us that in places like Japan, in this post-311 era, uh, talking about mental disorders still is quite a taboo subject. So much so that stress, in the popular sense, people don't talk about stress. How do they deal with stress then? Uh, you bottle it up deep inside. And how, how does that express itself then? Well, in very antisocial and negative ways. Is that how we want to treat mental disorders and certain psychological issues that emerge from the challenges of society, the challenges of unreasonable demands, the challenges of lack of faith in the future, the challenges of a broken political system. Is that how we want to treat it? By just saying, you're segregated from society. You must be psychotic. Or do we want to try to incorporate people into society a little bit more? And isn't it funny, talking about the political situation, that especially in America recently, in the year 2020, how do we talk 
how do many people talk about their political opponents? Oh, that person is crazy. That person is incompetent. That person has a mental disorder. And by labeling somebody with a mental disorder or by labeling them as psychotic or by labeling them as crazy, what are we doing? We're saying, I don't need to talk to you. Is that the society we want to live in? And I wonder if Fujino is challenging us with that question. If Fujino is saying, wait, maybe we should bring people into society a little bit more and not label so many people as psychotic. At least that's how I'm reading this piece. And with that attitude towards sympathy and patience and understanding of those of us who are challenged with society, who can't deal with those difficult situations as well as others. I wonder if it's that person who's psychotic, and this is Michel Foucault's problem, the challenge that he poses to us. Is it that person who's psychotic or is it society that's psychotic? that has driven that person crazy. And I think that Fujino is asking us to create a society that doesn't create psychotics. And when we live in a society that uh, drives people a little bit crazy, let's try to recognize that and pull them in a little bit. Otherwise, they might become serial killers which is going to be so much worse, isn't it? We'll see each other next time. Bye-bye.